this week we'll learn all about gathering information. This week is all about executing those strategies we talked about last week and then digging into your results. In particular, we're going to discuss different types of information, strategically reading through a source, and citations. I also want to briefly remind you of the difference between a search engine and a library database. So a search engine, something like Bing or Google Scholar, is more interested in grabbing everything that's within reach. Quantity is valued over quality. As such, you only get information about a resource that that resource provides about itself. So nothing deeper than maybe scratching the surface. A library database like Academic Search Premier or Web of Science is more focused on providing you with curated information. You have a much greater depth of information about a resource and that quality is valued over the quantity. Databases are also able to hire people to provide this quality information. So why talk about, why think about gathering information? So I think it's important because scholarship is a conversation and thinking about gathering information is helping you enter that conversation. Um, scholarship does happen at many different levels and with many different people, you included, uh, all of whom bring their own perspectives and ideas to this conversation. Um, this also does mean there is a lot of information out there and even after figuring out where you want to do your search, so maybe you found the perfect database, sometimes it can be tricky to figure out the exact right resource. So our next points of discussion are going to focus on figuring out what you're looking at and how to determine if it's the right fit for what you're doing. Part one, we're going to talk about different types of information. So I'm gonna talk about three specific types of information that you're likely to come across when you're searching these databases. We'll talk about popular literature, scholarly literature, as well as trade literature or, or publications. Starting with popular literature, the purpose of popular literature is generally to inform and entertain the general readers. So who writes it? The authorship of popular publications is often journalists or freelancers, and they're often paid for by the magazines that they work for. Very often, these are non-specialists. Coverage for popular literature often includes current events in a field, profiles of people, places, or events, or political opinions. It's often a broad variety of public interest topics, and it's very often cross-disciplinary. Again, the audience is the general population, popular literature, or the populace. And examples include Time Magazine, The New York Times, Psychology Today, and Science News. And here is an example of an article found in popular literature. Scholarly literature's main purpose is to communicate research and scholarly ideas. Authorship includes scholars and researchers who are experts in the field. Coverage is often their research. They're reporting on what they're doing, what they're working on. So this is very current information. This also means in a scholarly publication, they can go through the process of peer review where information is vetted by a group of peers, so other researchers in that field before it is published in a journal. The audience is other scholars, researchers, and students. I will say of particular importance is this term primary literature. Primary literature means this is someone's original reporting of phenomenon they have observed. In the sciences, this means experiments a researcher has conducted themselves. In other fields, for example in history, this might be letters written by an author or original correspondence between two people. Again, this is when someone is documenting their original observations of the world around them. Examples of scholarly literature. So, so you'll find examples of these in journals like Journal of American History, Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, Brain, among others. And here is an example of a scholarly article. 
So finally, we'll talk about trade and professional literature. The purpose is to provide professional support and to apply information. Authorship is often professionals and practitioners in the field. Again, they're reporting out about their experiences in their field. Coverage is news in a particular field, brief reports on research, or opinions about trends and events. And the audience is often, again, practitioners in the field. This is for professional development purposes. Examples include American Libraries, Adweek, Backstage Magazine, Accountancy, and Popular Science. Here's an example of an article in a professional magazine or a professional journal. So each of these resources is valuable and important for different reasons. Popular literature is important in disseminating information to the population about maybe interesting research that's happening. The value of scholarly publications is really among the scientists for quickly disseminating or relatively quickly disseminating information about what they're doing in a rigorous and thorough manner. For trade and professional literature, one of the benefits there is really about sharing practices and sharing about what you're doing in a field to help others be more successful. So how do you figure out which resource is which? How do you figure out what type of resource you're looking at? Um, the tips that we've gone over here should help some, but use your best judgment. If you're ever unsure, you can either ask a librarian or you can ask a professor. So now we're going to talk about strategically reading through a particular resource. So we're going to go back to the scholarly article I showed you as an example earlier. So the first thing I do want to point out is my own bias. So this is something of course to reflect on and keep in mind, um, but I search for metacognition and curiosity because these are a couple of things I'm interested in. Um, and to be entirely honest, the first time I searched this, I did misspell curiosity. So when I searched metacognition and curiosity as it was misspelled, I got no hits. So databases are great, but they are not spell checkers. So if you find that you're not getting any hits, just check your own spelling like I did. All right, so I'm pointing out my own bias. So again, I searched metacognition and curiosity, again, spelled correctly, and I got a nice list of hits. In the one I picked, number five, an academic search premiere, I clicked that one because it had some nice pictures. <laughs> I think about why this is important to recognize or to think about because we like pretty graphs. We like being able to look at something that is visually pleasing or easy to digest visually. So keep that in mind. That's one of my own biases. Just make sure you're aware of your own biases as you go out and do research. So I have an article that's part of a list of search results. So how do I know this is the perfect resource for me or a good place for me to get started with my research? So your first line of defense to see if this is the right fit for you is to look at the abstract. Does the abstract sound kind of close to what you're interested in? Does it capture your interest in any way? Um, this is, again, going to be your first line of defense in selecting an article or passing it for something else. Again, always check out those keywords and subject terms. You're going to be able to buff up your vocabulary this way. And again, it's a great way to see how experts talk about your subject or talk about this topic. For me, next time I search, I might include thought and thinking or cognitive analysis in my search. For scientific articles, it's important to remember that very often these articles will follow a very precise formula. They're going to have an introduction, probably right before that they'll have the abstract, but then they have the introduction, methods, results, and the discussions and or conclusion section. So your job as an information seeking person is to just check out the introduction and then skip the stuff in the middle for now um, and go right to the discussion and conclusions. The stuff on the middle, so the results, the methods section, depending on what you're doing, you don't necessarily have to read through those sections. For the research I'm doing for this Wikipedia article, I don't necessarily need to understand the particular methods of how this experiment was conducted. I can instead focus on the introduction and the discussion and conclusion section, and that will give me a lot of information I need to come to my own conclusions. So for me, I might go back and check out the results section too. 
This section can help me understand the reasoning behind the discussion section or the conclusions section and gives me an opportunity to come to my own conclusions. I might also find I have my own questions to ask. It can be good to look through the results as well just to make sure everything lines up with the conclusions of the paper. So you might wonder why I'm leaving out the methods section so much. Um, so the methods are an excellent section to dive into as you become a more experienced researcher. Don't get hung up on the methods section right now, and especially not for your Wikipedia article. Um, there are numerous reasons to dive into the methods or methodology, but at this stage, and especially for this class, you don't necessarily need to read through that methodology section. Caveat? Always defer to the instructions of your assignment. So even though I say don't worry about the methods, maybe you're taking a methods class right now and it's really important that you understand those. So just keep that in mind. All right, so that's a lot about determining if a scientific article is relevant for your work. And a lot of that holds true for other disciplines as well. Other disciplines might not have such a formulaic approach to their articles, um, but still check out the headings of each section in your article. Do these make sense? Do they seem interesting? Do they seem relevant? Is the introduction of a subheading relevant? Are they pulling things together appropriately? Again, it's ultimately up to you to determine if a resource is appropriate for your work, but hopefully these hints help. So now, citations. Their importance and how they can expand your search. So citations, I like to think of them as both waypoints and acknowledgements. They can help point readers to where you got your information and also help note that you're indebted to the work of others. All research is building off of the work of others, so it's important to note that work along the way. We'll talk more about the importance of citations when we talk about managing information in a couple of weeks, but generally, citations can help you expand your search by helping you look both forwards and backwards. So thinking about going backwards, so all research, again, is built off of previous work. Even brand new fields have their roots in other fields. That's what the introduction section of any academic paper refers to and also is its role. Um, this introduction section sets the stage for that research. So be sure to check out the work cited session, look through that introduction session, see what's cited, and follow your citation trail. This might help you understand the foundation of your work a little bit better, or it can provide you again with more critical information to your own work. So going forward, the research you're currently reading is likely being used by others. The number of citations doesn't necessarily demonstrate the article's worth. In terms of going forward, the research you're currently reading is likely being used by others. The number of citations doesn't necessarily demonstrate the worth of an article. Some fields do move more slowly than others, and perhaps it was ahead of its time. It's ultimately, again, up to you to determine the worth of a particular article. So going forward can be a little bit tricky. It's a little bit harder to pull that together and to harvest that information. Again, there's lots of research happening by lots of different people. I think the easiest thing to do is um, to use Google Scholar to give you a window into scholarship moving forward. So let's look at that article I found one more time. So I entered the title of that article in quotes in Google Scholar and hit search. So, and of course, yay, <laughs> and wonderful yay, um, it's my only hit. So great, so there it is. Um, so sometimes I will say I have found that Google Scholar is not this smart. If you're having trouble finding your article in Google Scholar, maybe shorten the article title a little bit so you're just getting the core information, but keep it in those quotes. And again, remember that Google Scholar doesn't grab everything. All right, so I can already see that this has been cited by 29 other researchers, or again, 29 other researchers that Google Scholar knows about. I click cited by, and now Google Scholar is linking to all of the things that cite this paper. 
And actually, as I'm looking through, um, I found on page two something that piqued my interest. This is also one that I see has the UM links button. I click that, and again, that's true on any database. You see the maroon UM links, or in this case, just the text-based UM links button, and it'll sync you up with our databases. So I click that link, and that linking up process looks like this beautifully formatted little page. So I can see full text is available from Springer Link from 1997, which means UMass Libraries subscribes to this big thing called Springer Link, and we have access to materials in this journal from 1997. So that's uh, not a lot of deep information, but it does give me some context for what to expect. So I click go and ta-da, here's my paper. I click view article and there's the whole thing. Excellent. And again, just like before, I can see things like keywords, the abstract, and more citations. So this looks like a pretty excellent resource. So I'm going to add that to my list of resources. So to wrap up, this week we talked about different types of information, so the differences between popular literature, scholarly literature, and trade or professional publications. We talked about strategically reading through a source, and we've touched on citations. So that's it for now. May your information gathering efforts be fruitful, and happy searching!